It's a fairly common physiological reaction when it comes to, um, let's say, a trauma response, um, where essentially, you know, the, the, the nervous system takes over from you. And so one of the first signs of, um, let's say, a trauma response, and when we are saying trauma response, we are talking very broadly, right? I define trauma as something that necessitates, a, like an injury that necessitates a, a coping reaction, right? That could be somebody poking you really hard in a massage as much as it could be, you know, somebody driving into you with their car or whatever, right? It, it, it doesn't have to be heinous to produce a trauma response. It's just something that necessitates a physical response. Uh, coping response, right, or emotional coping response or mental coping response, typically a combination thereof. And so one of the first thing that happens when you have to react to, let's say, a an injury or, or in this case, um, probably an old injury, right, is that the body goes into survival. And when the body goes into survival, the let's say, executive thinking function will be dialed down, way down, and the survival response will be dialed way up. So typically what would that would mean, let's say, if we're all sitting here and, you know, we're having a nice time and it's all fine, and suddenly we hear, like, rustling out there. And we're like, oh, what is this rustling? And I'm going, oh, I don't know. This doesn't sound like any of my animals. And suddenly some gigantic, like, imagine we don't have him here, but some grizzly bear comes around the corner, right? That would be hilarious, actually. <laughs> Nothing between us and a grizzly bear than a little screen door, yeah. right? And now what would happen to all of us is to, well, <laughs> let, me, let me be more specific. What would happen to all of us is we would have a survival reaction. <clears throat> Depending on previous experiences, as well as general disposition, there's, there's different things that happen in different bodies at different times, but depending on that, all of us would um, have some kind of a survival moment. Some of us would start hyperventilating, which we all would start hyperventilating, probably more or less, but not all of us actually, uh, but some of us would start hyperventilating, we'd get tunnel vision, our heart would beat really, really, really fast, we'd have metallic taste on our tongue, which is the adrenaline rushing into the system and getting the body ready to either kick some serious bear ass or run as fast as we can out that door, right? So that would happen. So our body would produce what it would need to survive. And part of that is that the um, mobilizing of the adrenaline and the fast heartbeat and the fast breath produces a kind of a um, reaction in the body where you can have tingling and numbness in the hand and feet. And this year, particularly, people experience a lot when they do holotropic breath work. It has to do with the CO2 exchange, it's a whole thing. Um, and so that it, it even you know has a name and everything because it's so common um, as in it comes to the breath to the to the you you breathe too much for what your system needs right particularly if you breathe so much what you, for what your system needs if you're not expending it because as we were talking earlier usually you breathe as much as you need to have optimal situation so if we would actually have to run from the bear we would ca get enough breath and oxygen into us so that our <laughs> extremities would be fully oxygenated so we could run as fast. But if we are actually not running from a bear because this is an old stuff stored in the body or it's mental and not physical threat, then that oxygen can't go anywhere and then you have these things happen. So that, it's a very specific thing that comes with essentially an aborted fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. We wouldn't be uh, complete in this exploration. So, so 
fighting as hard as you can, fleeing as fast as you can. There's also, and this is why I'm saying not all of us would be hyperventilating, there's freeze. Some people, and it is said, and this makes sense from a biological standpoint, it is said that women more often than not freeze. And there's, of course, a reason for that, because imagine we're in a tribal context and we're all in the cave, so to speak, or, you know, in some nice hut in the savanna, mm -hmm. and suddenly something happens, marauding tribes. What would we do with our children? We'd go hide in the bushes, mm -hmm. right? We wouldn't fight. So freeze effectively down-regulates the system so you can be undetected in the bushes. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Your feet go numb, so you're not fidgeting. Your arms go numb, so you're not fidgeting. Your face goes what they call so nicely, you know that, you're a therapist, right? Um, flat affect, right? So flat affect, meaning we kind of go, uh, guess what? You're not blinking either because that could be detected in the grass, right? Your breath goes really shallow. Your metabolism slows down. You're not moving. You're like literally wading it out in the bushes. Right? Because of that, and because it's more often happening in women than it is in men, and because it's not trauma, you know, proper trauma therapy uh, isn't really taught as much as it should be in, let's say, emergency medicine, it's often... Um, undiagnosed when people come to the ER. They present as actually having almost lower than normal vitals. So they're not seen as having had a traumatic incident or being in shock, mm. but it's actually freeze. Mm. And I remember when I was in, at university, I, I, I co-drove ambulance. You had like these jobs you could do. And one of them was to, was ambulance, uh, you know, a, a attendant. And it happened a lot. People presented as totally calm, but they were actually in full-blown freeze. And how you typically, the only way you can tell is you typically their face doesn't move and their eyes don't blink. You know? And they're also a bit unresponsive. Mm -hmm. You know, a little bit, they, they're not computing things as fast as you need them to. And then that's kind of how you, you know, after a while you know. But uh, when I studied trauma therapy, uh, they had just kind of, gotten to that. Oh. And then just to round things out, because it's so much fun to talk about this shit, at least for me, <laughs> is what now, because now, you know, now, now we're all about trauma, right? It's the funniest thing is in, in, in therapy, and you, you've been at it for a while, right? I've been at it for 26 years now, and in those 26 years, I've seen one fad after the other. And it's like these they're not fads per se, but they, they enter pop culture in this faddy way, right? We're all now doing, you know, seeing everything through love languages. And now we're all looking at attachment theory. And then it's the drama triangle. And now we're on to trauma, right? So now, oh yeah, trauma and the other one that everybody's now banging on about endlessly is uh, how to recover from being with a narcissist. Uh, <laughs> Do not even get me started on that one. Right? I don't know what is wrong with me that I am always attracting narcissists. Could it not be just about me once? Right? <laughs> but, but, but because of that, um, now they talk about fawn. Right? Now, when I went to school, this wasn't called fawn. It was simply called Stockholm Syndrome. Right? So fawn, nowadays fawn, because it's much, much cooler, you know, fight, fight, freeze, fawn. Uh, but, but essentially, when you have to align with your aggressor in order to survive, right? That's a, it's a really important one to know about, right? When you have to align with your aggressor in order to survive, you're going to look compliant and you're going to look like you are in a situation that isn't good for you. And we all know people, and if you're a therapist or anything of that kind, you have loads of people who can't leave abusive situations because they're in full on alignment for survival, mm -hmm. right? And it's not just people who've been kidnapped by some freak and kept in a 
you know, basement for three years or five years or 20 years. It's everyday people. And this doesn't only happen in relationship. It happens a lot at work. Mm. You know, people who you owe your career or spiritual teachers or stuff like that, where you essentially have to kind of suck it up and really buy it so you can survive, so to speak. Right. So I'm saying all of this to say what you probably experience in that moment is something that's been there for a while. But one of the things that happens when you do regular embodiment practice, and it's a, it's a very specific um, feature of nonlinear movement, is you sensitize to the body. And so suddenly the things that were usually somewhat submerged, so you're not paying that close attention to them, are noticed. And so then what happens is somebody does poke you or massage some fascia that has some old freeze or fight or flight that's, that has gotten stuck in your system and you will have like a triggered response. It doesn't have any emotional content. It's just the body having some memory that's being worked out. So that's actually excellent. Unpleasant, but excellent, right? Um, the important piece is, this is not for you, but in general, when you have people release trauma from your body, these need to be people who are incredibly skilled and incredibly clean. And what I mean by that is there's whole, whole strains of people who essentially make a living from re-traumatizing people in subtle ways mm -hmm. uh, so that they come back, right? right? So the proper attendance to that situation is somebody caring for you without offering you advice, having you do something, making you wrong, making you right, or qualifying your experience. Mm -hmm. That's super important. They're essentially there to hold that thing for you. You do it. You don't have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to justify it or thank them for it or uh, be appreciative they're just doing a service you take the service you go home you have a bath you sleep well it's done right right so and that's that's the thing if, you, if a massage therapist can do that for you pay them well appreciate them thoroughly and you'll notice as we go into this stuff in the turn of body more, you'll notice all this subtle stuff floating up. And a lot of it just is they're like little bubbles. They pop up and they pop away. And then there are certain things where you'll notice you need a little bit more work. And those are the things you can then further attend here and then outside of here with the appropriate people. So, but you have to be able to notice it first. And when you can notice it, then it's really useful yeah well you know nonlinear is something that we actually teach people to become facilitators and so a lot of our facilitators have children and uh, practice with their own children and some of them actually teach children and so um, of course you know there's many modalities and all of that you're not doing that but what you can do very easily so so uh, we have one guy in Switzerland he works with nonlinear, he's a psychiatrist and a psychologist, um, and he works with sexually abused refugee children, Syrian ref refugee children, sexually or physically abused, you know, both. And so the way he does it is he just kind of sits on the floor with them and he very informally talks with them and goes, see, when, when I get tight, I start moving like this. And, you know, he just kind of demonstrates while he's doing it. And, and he goes, go oh, try that, try it with me. And think, so you can just go, oh, this, this is something that feels really nice. You want to try it. So you don't give any formal instruction. You just take, come, come five minutes, uh, join me, right? So interestingly enough, this is, I'm not saying you should do this with your nine-year-old. She's maybe a bit old, he or she. She, she yeah. She might be a bit old for that. But when, after the fire, some of my dogs survived the fire. Unfortunately, not all my dogs survived the fire. But the one who did were hugely traumatized, like, you know, like crazy traumatized. 
And so what I would do with my dogs is I would put their back to my belly and then take their little legs and then we'd like sit oh. together and move till their kind of freeze patterns broke up. And Lily, who is so freaking hyper, she was like this after the fire. Somebody found her way up the road dodging, you know, burning bushes and shit like that. So she was, she was like this, and I just would like hold her and do that. And people do that with their kids and babies. But the important thing also to know is when you raise children, um, they have it naturally, right? Their, their bodies know how to get rid of traumatic situations and how do kids do it? They cry, they tremble, they shake, you know, and then eventually they're done. And that's how the nervous system does it. So the best thing you can do when you can is encourage them to actually let their body do the thing and not tell them to pull themselves together and stop and stuff like that. If you, That's a very instrumental thing is to not make children you know get their shit together but allow that to take place now that's not to say if somebody has a massive tantrum trauma drama moment not trauma moment that's different but that <laughs> right, that 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 particular breath the double in long exhale that's a physiological way to downregulate the system and when you kind of make somebody not do that that's when people learn how to kind of, you know, solidify the stuff. But you just invite them along. There's nothing to it in that sense when you do informal practice other than you just say, hey, this feels really good. You know, just wiggle around with them on the floor for a bit. It's fun. I do it with my nieces all the time. <laughs> my nieces are now 11 and... Well, now she's 19. She you know, can't be bothered with me, but <laughs> whatever. How far back do I start? <laughs> so is the question with me. Um, in general, this, these are, you know, I'm, I'm being general. We talk about this in great detail in the teacher trainings and stuff. But in general, one of, one of the things to keep in mind when we're looking at um, rewilding the body or coming back to the natural genius of the body is what I like calling it, um, is that we have to remember what the body is built for. So that always means surviving and thriving. So what I, do I mean with surviving and thriving? Surviving is staying alive uh, and also essentially feeding yourself and clothing yourself and stuff like that, but mostly staying alive. Thriving are things like rest and digest, right? So we have the two systems that we're looking at, parasympathetic, sympathetic, you know, uh, fight or flight, but that's also just survival and feed, or, feed and breed or rest and digest, how it's often called. So those two together create homeostasis, not just one. It's important because there's such a cult around not, you know, not having that one side of our nervous system. No, you need it, right? But it just can't be chronically active. So in the thriving domain is things like sexual reproduction, also pleasure, the senses, uh, having proper sleep, like the exposure, stuff like that. Humans are the only mammals that show their sensitive areas, the areas that hold the organs fully to another human, right? When you look at dogs, you know this probably, right? That when a dog um, shows submission, they turn upside down and they offer their throat and their belly, which makes them incredibly vulnerable, right? And that's an act of saying, I'm harmless, don't harm me. I'm giving up. You are the strongest one. We do that all the time. And so because of that, we have subtle uh, protection or not so subtle protection in that whole front surface of the body. You can feel it and you probably felt a little bit of that today and that's why we did it, is when you turn towards somebody, parts of you armor up, right? Parts of you kind of lock up a bit, you protect a bit, you might shrink back a bit, you don't look or you're kind of looking sideways or you make a joke or all of those things that we do so, to, to kind of protect us uh, and declare that we're harmless. 
So because of that, one of the things that's really, that I found very, you know, I developed nonlinear over 30 years. So these are not all things that started out like this, but that I found very useful and that people, and including myself, because I tested all of this stuff on myself as well, uh, reported as very useful is protecting and giving that area protection. So there's li layers to that. It's being able to feel and articulate these areas, and but at the same time having that that natural protection that anybody but us has. Even uh, monkeys who go somewhat upright always will kind of protect a bit. We don't, right? We're like hi, and then you know we hug somebody to us and all of that. So that motion and that kind of disposition. Uh, lends itself to a subtle relaxation. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that energy tends to go up and out mm. when you stand. And you see that sometimes. One of my favorite ways to observe that sometimes when, what happens is when people do their ecstatic dance and they're like on their tippy toes and their arms are waving in the wind, right? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> do not stand up in nonlinear then, because that's what's going to happen. You're used to disembodying and going upwards. Some people tend to do that as a general physical disposition. Some people tend to do that because of previous needs to dissociate or dislocate. Dislocate is a bit less than dissociate. That's why I make a difference there, where you're like, you're slightly out. You're not all the way out, but you're slightly out, right? And for some people, it's just really pleasant to float up in those fine realm domains and not be that connected with the stuff that happens down here, right? So that's why I'll invite you to not stand up, uh, because that happens to a lot of people. And in that state, you're you feel like you're doing nice things with your body, but it's in the slice where it's already happening all the time up here. And that's also partly habit force, right? You're used to being up here. And then when you have to come down here, sometimes the, the, the bats have to come out of the cave, so to speak, right? You shine the light in there, all kinds of stuff flies out and it's not very pleasant. <laughs> It's important to, because we have all these ways we get out, pounding it out. Some people moan and groan like, you know, they're like in a porn movie. Um, you, know, there's some, some, you know, there's all kinds of things that people do to get out of actually being with what is. And it's not bad and it's, you know, there's a place for both. It's like, as always, you want the option. You don't want to have a knee jerk towards one thing and not have the ability to do the other. So that's always the thing. Then you can make a choice. You can go, fuck it. I just want to, you know, flail around up here and have a good time, right? There's nothing wrong with that. That's like saying, fuck it. I'm going to have potato chips tonight, which I did. Um, <laughs> a small handful, right? So you, you, you know that's not what you want to do every day, but, but then you can also have the ability to eat super healthy or to stay down on the ground with yourself and be with whatever the hell crops up. There's an honesty there that's both unpleasant, sobering, and amazing right? at different times. And here's the other thing. You don't have to do it, right? This is the other thing that you will learn in this context is you don't have to do it. I'm inviting you to do it. If you don't do it, nothing's going to happen, right? You know, if you decide you want to be on your tippy toes, I'm not going to keep you. I might invite you back down. If you don't want to go back down, I don't care. And that meaning it's not me, right? It's like I'm not... I just figure you need to do your thing, right? And uh, all I'm doing is giving you options. But if you don't feel like it or you, if you want to just lay there because you've had it, okay. That's the whole thing with nonlinear is we don't impose, mm. right? There's no imposition. I'm not going, feel this now, <laughs> right? It's like I'm just dropping a, a thing and then I let you run with it. And you run with it or you don't run with it. And if you no longer feel like it, you stop, right?
and, and that way you actually empower yourself, right? which is always a good idea. Not only did you come back down, but you can articulate that you did that. Mm -hmm. And how can you articulate that? You felt the difference. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the thing is that none of these states are a problem. None of these states are pathological or wrong mm -hmm. or need to be, you know, fixed. Mm -hmm. They're normal physiological states that are the product of us having lived a life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't want to feel certain thing and there's a reason for that and disassociation in general in the clinical sense as well as in the less clinical sense is a good thing because it's actually your body going okay i'm out this is too much this is too intense i can't deal with this this isn't healthy i'm gonna split for a moment right that's what it's there for the problem is when that becomes habitual mm -hmm. when it's triggered by things that are no longer true when it debilitates you, or when it keeps you from making appropriate decisions. How do you know you're going? Well, you have to have been in to know that you're out. Sometimes you connect to spirit and that's just that. Mm. Sometimes connecting to spirit is a convenient way out of feeling the <laughs> things <laughs> you don't want to feel. One is uh, a union with God, the other one is a spiritual bypass. What's what? You're going to have to find out. Nobody can tell you. Typically, I would say that that moment of actual union leaves you with a very open and relaxed body, while the bypass leaves you with exactly the unpleasant feeling that you went away from in the aftermath. That's how you can typically differentiate over time. But yeah, these are just good learnings. And then, you know, you can deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, like yesterday, um, you know, this whole thing with the screens happened, which was three hours of my life I'm never going to get back. Uh, <laughs> you know? And in the aftermath, I uh, broke my most favorite. I have these... They actually make them in Mexico, but uh, I still had one from Austria. They're these rose balls that you stick in with the roses. They're these glass balls, colored glass balls. And in Austria, you have them to ward off evil spirits. I always like to have one at the house. <laughs> 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 and I broke that thing. Yes, like dropped some pot on it accidentally, meaning I was out of it a bit. And then... Um, Tao was with me, there was a light bulb broken, oh, we need to plug those lights in uh, eventually, later. Um, thank you. Um, th there's, we have lights there so you can find the bathroom and one of the light bulbs was broken and I twisted it and it broke in my hand. And mm -hmm. So I have two, uh, two cuts from within an hour. Wow. So w uh, after the first one I was like, oh yeah, I'm a bit out of it. And then after the second one I was like, okay, I better go and do some practice, right? And it's, a, what, it's just a thing. You go, oh, yeah, I'm a little bit out of it. Yeah, of course. I just, you know, screamed at people. And I had to hunt people down and scream at people. And then I had to find somebody who drove all the way to Ventura and get a, you know, stapler and some screen and all of that. There's nothing wrong with being out of it. The problem is if you stay out of it and you don't realize it and then you bark at somebody or you snap at somebody or you actually hurt yourself or um, you don't realize that that's what's happening and your whole perception of life gets skewed and stuff like that. It's not a problem being out. You just need to go, whoa, I'm out. Let me get back in. You know? And then you better have some tools. The best way to feel that is, let's say, if you've been chronically sleep deprived, yeah. right? So let's just say for whatever reason, you know, some people sometimes work on a dissertation or whatever, or you have like a stressful work job or whatever. And so now you've been chronically sleep deprived and um, you've only slept like two, three hours a night for a couple of weeks, right? Mm -hmm. So when you finally get to sleep, you are going to sleep, mm -hmm. You know, you're going to pass out, essentially. And it's going to be um, both very unpleasant and also very dysregulating because you, are, you don't have proper sleep cycles. Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, to assume that that's how it's going to continue would be a mistake, obviously, meaning if you have a situation like that, you'll you'll have a bit of like weird sleep. You sleep for a few days straight, pretty much. You're super exhausted. And then eventually your body regulates into waking during the day and sleeping at night and, you know, and things. The same is true for what you're describing. If you're chronically deprived of that let down, that down regulation, when you have it, it will feel like you can't get out of it, like you can't wake up after you've been sleep deprived, right? That's not going to be the case once you have reached a, a kind of a, a spot where things are in a normal range. So the key is to get to the normal range and then do enough ongoing small practice to keep yourself in the normal range. So the best practice you could possibly do is the kind of practice that is like flossing. I always talk about, you know, uh, certain practices like uh, it's like a psycho-emotional flossing. You know, you floss your teeth every day. You don't do it for hours, right? Um, you just do enough maintenance so nothing falls out. Like my dentist always used to say, uh, only floss the teeth you want to keep, right? That's like a... <laughs> They think they teach you this in dentist school because several of my dentists have said that, right? So it's like one of those tropes you learn in dentist school, right? It's a little bit like that with, with body embodiment practice. Do enough so that there's a maintenance level, not so that uh, you're out for the day or that it's too little to make a difference. And so how you figure that out is you come up with a minimum and typically, um, I would say for most people, the minimum is probably five minutes, not more than that. Because let's be really honest, right? Yeah. I mean, when? Yeah. Right? So, so that's really important. And anything else is an aspirational practice, which sounds great when you come back from a weekend, but you know, last a couple of days. And there's lots of people who have gone to workshops. You're like, yes, I'm changing my life. <laughs> Three days later, you feel like a total loser, right? So, and, and then the, the cycle starts again, right? So you want to do so little that even if all else goes wrong, you can do it, like, let's say, in the shower, which is one place I always practice. I need a lot of conditioner. So, you know, I, I just stand there with the conditioner and the face stuff and the whatever, right? And I, I just, like, do nonlinear in the shower while warm water falls down on me. And, and if I get nothing else done in that day, practice-wise, I've at least checked in with my body. So that's your practice. Just enough to floss the teeth you want to keep, so to speak. <laughs> then from there, you have um, a range of options for when you have more time or when you want to go deeper and or. Right. Sometimes you just go like, oh, well, I have an hour. I can put some music on and move for an hour, and that's probably gonna feel really good, right, or not. Um, but you do it, and then that produces a certain kind of finding and result. And maybe you'll have a nap afterwards, or maybe you'll go have an hour. I'm gonna sleep, right? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you go, wow, there's the stuff. It's like there, it's been there for days. Let me tend to it. And then you set out to actually remedy something. Mm -hmm. So a good practice, what makes a practice a really good practice is that you can use it in all three ways. You can use it as a remedy, you can use it as maintenance, or you can use it for the fun of it mm -hmm. or to deepen. The fun of it to me is deepen, you know, mm -hmm. so that you become, your nervous system becomes more robust. The, p the problem is the deficit. When you have to dig out of a massive hole, mm -hmm. you are not going to be functional. You know? And so that's why most people don't dig out of the massive hole, because it feels like, well, this is going to take all day. I don't have all day. Right? Mm -hmm. So you chip away at it, one shovel at a time. You know? And eventually you're on level ground, and then it's maintenance, and then you could actually build it up. So when the next time you have to deplete yourself, you're not digging a hole, you're actually just shoveling a little bit away from the big mountain that you've built up. 
and then that's a really good you know good way to work with an embodiment practice is you you know sometimes you put sand in the bank sometimes you shovel sand in a hole right but you kind of maintain certain levels and then you can also become more sensitive as to when you're starting deplete below ground so to speak right and then you can catch that and then it's a little bit more like whoa i'm about to start digging a hole i want to take a day off or an hour off or whatever right so that's how that's how good sustainable practice can look so non habitual movement is a funny thing because people often go well that's not authentic exactly right because what is authentic authentic is essentially habits and patterns you've already established that's authentic really i hate to break it to people who are like really into being authentic right <laughs> it's like some shit you learned earlier on right N- new stuff is never authentic because you don't have habits and patterns but it's new stuff and it can create new pathways it also actually really allows for neuroplasticity to occur So what you do is you do a movement that feels really weird. So here's a few good hinters. Move at a third of the speed that you would want to move. Like I love slow mo motion particularly with a really fast beat where I essentially only move to every 6 or 8 speed. Right? that's really interesting like when you do kind of suspended slow mo stuff it's or you go like totally like <laughs> like you know the, the electrocuted style <laughs> uh that's also really good um moving up and down instead of undulating sideways sharp instead of round round instead of sharp do really jagged things do really fast stuff um stick your tongue out for like 10 minutes straight you know um try to see if you can you know kind of stretch your tongue enough that you can touch your chin some people can do that um you know like weird stuff that is so weird that it breaks you out of the thing yeah and that's also really fun yeah because what you'll discover is that some of those things um bring totally different parts out and then you you don't feel i know exactly what you're talking about in teacher training i sometimes talk about the poor circus elephant right yeah. when when you see people weave back and forth like a poor circus elephant right so that's it happens to all of us it's comforting you know it's very comforting rocking 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 <laughs> so sometimes that nothing wrong with that but not in nonlinear right because once again now we're linear back and forth back and forth right so um you just break it up and you can amuse yourself endlessly with breaking it up it's good for everyone to know mm-hmm. right this is also true outside of nonlinear sometimes you know you just got to shake it up in the sense that non habitual stuff breaks you out of your mold driving to work a different way brushing your teeth with the other hand and the one that i still haven't mastered turning your toilet paper roll the other way uh, <laughs> that's what, that's where i draw a line <laughs> i just can't fucking do it i do it and then it bugs me so much i'm like fuck that yeah uh, so yes so so we we all have our rats right uh this is this is a favorite one of mine but that's so that you know that thing you know just makes you and then you that something else shows up you know <laughs>